Hello and welcome to yet another exciting episode of Economic Forum. My name is Tawanda Gudlanda. You will recall last week the program ended on a high as the Minister of uh, Higher Tertiary Education, Science and Technology Development was about to talk about industry and commerce and the role that education plays in accelerating uh, economic growth in that sector. And uh, thanks to him, he gave us more time for us to discuss it as such. We shall continue our discussion uh, with the Minister. Honourable, thank you so much, sir, for allowing us uh, to continue uh, this uh, very important discussion. Last thank week, you. you ended uh, by unpacking um, a particular model yes. where education causes industry, where most people would think that, in fact, industry should be the driver of, of higher and tertiary education, given the fact that they are the, the education provides the total uh, pool, whether in terms of uh, technology, uh, innovation, and even the skills base mm -hmm. to accelerate industrialization. Yes. Thank you very much, Tawanda. I just want to uh, go back to the issue of what causes industry. First of all, industry basically means hard work to meet human needs. Human needs are the first thing. Then, when people see that they need food, they have to teach each other how to make food. That edu that's education. But they might want to make that food at a large scale. Therefore, they will make factories so that the factories can produce the food, the food that they need. And whatever they need, they educate each other how to. So we have a model where we were used to when you get, uh, when you are finished with your program, you go and work at any industry. Yes. But nobody was asking a question, where was this industry coming from? I am talking about a country like ours as a former colonized country. In a former colonized country, the innovation for industrialization was being done in the UK. Then, when they do their innovations and they make their industry, they will send their industrial outlets to Zimbabwe. Yeah. Then the people in Zimbabwe would think that industry comes and will be educated how to operate that industry. But the thinking to make that industry exist was made elsewhere. Therefore, we grew up thinking that we have to go to industrial sites without asking ourselves, where did that industry come from? Now, reality check. In an independent country, because I was talking about colonial education, colonial education was to educate people so that they operate the industry that were innovated in the UK, so that you can produce what is needed in the colonial system. Let me just be very clear. It had an objective. That's why it was called Education 3.0, Education for Literacy, so that you can be able to balance and account for money, which is not yours. Clear. Now, in an independent country, we have to learn that we have to produce the industry that meets our human needs from our education, which means we have to rewire our education system. That's why we rewired it in terms of objectives, from Education 3.0, Teaching, Research and Community Service, to Education 5.0, Heritage Based, which is Teaching, Research, Community Service, Innovation, Industrialization. Realizing that we can only cause the industry ourselves. But we are not saying that we are not having, going to have investment type of industry. We are saying Zimbabwe is open for business, so we will be able to attract investment type of industry to come to Zimbabwe. But normally, investment type of industry comes to an innovative people. So the whole thing is a chicken and egg. But the most important thing that I want to tell you is that we cause the industry. Industry, I am Vandiripo, industry, you know, conserva. Industry will be caused so, by the actions of education. So in this instance, we should be seeing Professor Emon Murwira and the Ministry of Higher Education, education leading when it comes to industrialization or industrial growth in Zimbabwe. Are there any strategies that you've put in place to ensure that 
you do cause industry as you put it. If you look, for example, at the close coordination that is now in the, in the, in the government of Zimbabwe under the Second Republic, under His Excellency the President, the vision is what unites us. If you look, for example, at the industrial policy, in the industrialization policy, you will see that the Honorable Minister of Industry and Commerce has inserted innovation type industrialization within that, which actually shows the coordination. Because the realization is there is no industry that is not caused by education. It's either it's caused by education here or it was caused by education elsewhere. It always emanates from education. Then you have to make a choice. Do you want it to be caused by your education? Or do you want it to be caused by their education so that you are only a worker? Which then puts us in a very interesting uh, situation, uh, Honorable Minister, because if I will refer once again to our skills deficit, we must be in trouble then if we are to look at certain sectors of, of, of industrialization because we are looking at less than 5% skills base and yet we are saying we need to cause industry. How do we then make up for that gap? Let me tell you, Tawanda, that um, a solution to a problem is easily coined by understanding the problem. The National Critical Skills Audit was there to reveal for us what kind of skills deficits we have. Then after we found out our skills deficit, which is 62%, skills level 38%, and um, literacy level over 94%, we then said, how do we respond to it? We responded to it using heritage-based education 5.0 design. So you must, we must be able to see that it's Education 5.0 which is our response. So we detected the problem, we designed for it. Takai Rongera. So, you understand? So, so. I'll just ask you to pause there. Takai Rongera Nzara, nay. Join us in the next segment as we uh, find out more on that issue. Join us then. <laughs> Welcome back. We have the Minister of High and Tertiary Education, Innovation, Science and Technology Development, and we are focusing on industrialization, of course, being guided by Vision 2030. Now, one of uh, the most dynamic things that have happened in the Second Republic is the addition of innovation. And um, we've heard and we've seen um, universities setting up what are known as innovation hubs. That's good. What has been the purpose of these and have they drawn anything uh, or any link to industry the way that we want as Zimbabwe? Yes, thank you very much, Tawanda. An innovation hub by nature is the meeting place for, of faculty and private industry, as well as the public and private individuals that are innovative. Because we have the university which is the core of the university, which is the faculty. But in order to link the faculty with the industry, we had to do a structure which is called the innovation hub. The innovation hub is where all those good ideas that are coming from faculty are then looked at technically, are intellectually protected, and are marketed to potential startups and to the industry that is existing. So the Innovation Hub is a structure that completes the university industry link. In actual fact, no bandirach. This is where we link industry with the university. No kurongiranzara. Because what we are saying is, for the right problem, you must have the right tools to fight that. Zimbabwe, is going to industrialize itself. It's already industrializing itself. And it must have a method for doing that. The method is called innovation, research and innovation, science and technology, in order to industrialize. 
So the innovation hub is a structure, both conceptual, which we then represented physically, for taking good ideas, protecting the good ideas, as well as marketing the good ideas. To this end, you will find out that this year, by 4 December 2020, University of Zimbabwe had applied for 70 patents through the Innovation Hub. Yet, he has now applied for more than 20 patents. And MSU registered the patent of a new way of making roads in Zimbabwe. This is just showing you the movement that has taken place from idea to action. So you will see that at, the, at, at Chinoy University of Technology, they have done a lot. They are innovating in the dairy industry. We are now having almost like, uh, we are building the state of the art innovation for dairy. We are also doing that for beef, and we are doing that for feed and so forth and so on. And at NAST, we are doing things on the genomic technologies. You would know that NAST was instrumental in testing for COVID-19, in responding to COVID-19 by testing in Bulawayo. And this is coming from the Innovation Hub. Now we have to amplify where all these things were coming from. All our responses to COVID-19 were coming from the Innovation Hub. But all that can be amplified through funding or some form of investment. Um, to what extent um, do we then you know, attract investment? Because they say capital is shy and, 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 and Zimbabwe has somewhat suffered issues of investment. How, to what extent have we tried to paint a positive picture enough to attract uh, um, investment. The first most important thing is that the innovation hubs and the, the industrial parks that we've built to date are straight from the government of Zimbabwe. You know, money comes to where you are serious. We believe that it's not about being able to look nice to anyone. It's about being able to do things. Everybody is attracted by people who can do things. Forget about how you will paint your hair, how you will uh, spruce up your face. That's not the issue. The issue is in capability. When I am capable, whether you like the, my height or not, you will come to me. So Zimbabwe is concentrating on the right thing, being able to do things, being able to employ its education, high and tertiary education, its innovation, its science and technology to industrialize. Once you show capability, you will see how many investments will come to Zimbabwe. But how do we fare on the global market, uh, Honorable Minister, given the fact that other countries are also not sleeping, uh, just like what Zimbabwe is doing, coming up with various ways of, 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 of industrialization? To what extent um, have we stood against global competition? In actual fact, there is not much competition in the innovation field. The issue is you produce things that are needed by your people first. Before you can start thinking about many things, it's about things that are needed by your people, like food, <laughs> like water, like sanitizer, like this. So, in actual fact, there is so much space in terms of our place in the world, in terms of innovation. We have got intelligent people all over around the world. We are Zimbabweans. What we, they were able to do in that area is due to the configuration of the systems in those areas. So Zimbabwe did not have a problem with having intelligent people. It had a configuration problem. How do you utilize your intelligent people? What systems do you develop so that you can utilize them optimally? That's why we are now saying Education 5.0. That's why we are saying that our lecture is, can be, can, it cannot be just there to teach from 7 to 7 segment their time, some of the time will be used to attachment with the industry, which can be from ourselves or another person's industry, and the other time is used for innovation. When you give time to things that you care about, you will see that a country will change. This country is changing, and this country is going to industrialize. We have a method to do that, and we are going to do it. Let's talk about it in the third segment where we talk about industrial attachments for students. How do we then uh, have our students get uh, that exposure? Let's talk about it. Join us then.
Welcome back to the third and final segment where we are focusing on industrialization and of course the role of uh, innovation, science and technology uh, all under the uh, guidance of uh, higher tertiary education and I have uh, with us uh, Honorable Professor Morwina. Now, before we went to the break, you spoke about the need to set time for attachment, which is quite critical, but there's an outcry right now where a number of students are failing to even access uh, attachment. How then does this um, help you in any way when we have such a deficit? In actual fact, um, let me be very clear with the attachment. When you teach your students properly in areas that are useful, you will never run short of attachment. That's why we are now looking at the whole syllabi. If you look at the University of Zimbabwe, more than 80% of the programs are now new. It means they have rewired their program so that they, are, they can balance skills and knowledge. And it is at that point that people get needed. People who run after our students because of the reconfiguration that we have done for our education. So I'm talking about people, students that go to other people's industries. That's number one. Number two, I am talking about how we will attach our students, how we are already attaching our students to our industrial enterprise. For example, when we, have, we started with the beef biotechnology and uh, dairy biotechnology at Chinoy University of Technology, and on their farm, the students no longer need to go to anyone else's place. They will be attached there. It's because we have reconfigured our education so that industrialization becomes an integral part of their training. So you will see that people will come and say, ah, please, Chinoy, can you release at least two so that I can have them at my industry? The same thing is going is taking place at the University of Zimbabwe Agro-Industrial Park. If you go to that farm today, you will be able to see a new tad, new tad roads which are leading to industrial shelves new uh, center pivots, a lot of production that is taking place, we expect our students to go there and get attached there. Why they were not being able to be attached at the universities is because universities were not doing industrialization. So from now on as we go, it will not happen in one day though. It's gradual, but we are focused in the direction that we are going. Our students will be so wanted to the extent that industry will come begging for them but at they, their universities. But you've been under attack. You've been under attack when you talk about reconfiguration of, mm -hmm. of, of, of the curriculum, as it were, the modules and the programs themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the extent that uh, the accusation is that uh, some now are actually rendered redundant. What is the position? The issue is there is nothing useful that will be redundant. Redundance is for redundant things. So we will not stop at anything. We, when we call students to come to our universities, we are promising them skills. We are promising them knowledge. We are not going to shortchange them by maintaining things that no longer work. It is in national interest to make sure that Certain areas that we know are archaic have to remain in the museum, not in our classrooms, not in our lecture rooms. So change is going to happen. Change is already happening. So the issue is we will be able to improve as we discuss with industry, with community, with everybody. We are not going to do things without consultation. However, there are certain things that will have to stop because they have nothing to do with the 21st century. We should be fair to our students by teaching them the right things, not by people who just want to stay in power by doing things that they were doing in 1970 that are no longer useful in the 21st century. But That's what, selfishness. But what does it mean uh, for, 
for those that were beneficiaries of Education 3.0. I would want to take, you must be one of them yourself. Um, how do we find space for those that have been educated in that era with the sort of thinking that you are now talking about? It is the very same people, we, who are changing ourselves. The biggest change comes from within, from ourselves. We saw that the way our education was configured was to save colonial interests. So do they go back to school? No! It's a change of attitude. They are able to do. The issue is everybody who is in the higher tertiary education sector is very good. But we are only giving them more terms of reference to say, my friend, that practical that you said you did not have time, you were, I was only giving you 5% of the time. That you were not, I was not giving you time for practicals for student practice. It's now 30%. So we are giving people time, a lot of time, to innovate, to industrialize. So the lecturers at this moment, you know why I speak with conviction is that I'm together with my academic community. We know what we're doing. We are basically saying we are changing things that were constraining us in the past. And those in industry themselves, the captains of industry, who were used to a particular way of doing business, um, the way they were taught uh, to do, like you were saying, and, and, and bridging it with this new thrust that you are talking about. In actual fact, most people in industry are excited. You would know that on the 10th of January, 2018, His Excellency, uh, the President of the Republic, uh, Dr. Idim Nangago, he called all captains of industry, and he called all vice chancellors, and he called all principals of colleges to a discussion at the Rainbow Towers, which discussion was, we want to make our education useful to industry, and we want to make industry useful to our education. It's at that point that we started a huge dialogue. So all what we are doing right now, it's not solo music. This is an orchestra. Zimbabwe wants to industrialize and we have provided a method for which it has to industrialize and make our industry competitive. So this is what we've just done. It's a consensus. Kuironga <laughs> Honorable Minister, thank you so much for coming through uh, and finding time uh, to unpack very, very key issues within uh, your portfolio. Thank you very much, Chair Tawanta. There you have it, Zimbabwe. We have been looking quite, quite rigorously at uh, issues within high and tertiary education, as well as innovation, science and technology development. We've come to the end of the program. Join us again next time as we continue to unpack those key issues that foster our economy.